So good afternoon, everybody. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to Beth and Antoinette for giving me the opportunity to speak in this year's conference. And congratulations for the 20th year of having the Nurse Sex Symposium. Um, I know it's a long day, everybody. It will be quick. So contrast-induced nephropathy is a very important topic because that's part of what we do, correct? We give contrast dye. Um, I have nothing to disclose. So. Um, this will be what we'll be talking about, definition of sin, um, what is the pathogenesis behind it, the disease burden, how do we prevent this from happening, um, any new studies that are out there, um, and how do we take care of this problem. So what is contrast-induced nephropathy? It is um, defined as an acute kidney injury resulting from exposure to contrast dye. There is an increase in serum creatinine of 0.5 milligrams per deciliter, or 25% greater than baseline. It usually occurs at 48 to 72 hours after administration of contrast agent and persists for about two to five days. Um, we usually make this diagnosis when all alternative major injuries have been ruled out. Just as a quick reminder, um, the rifle criteria is um, put there. That is a definition for acute kidney injury and what is different with co contrast-induced nephropathy. Um, when we look at serum creatinine, you know, we mentioned that it's the increase of 0.5%, 0.5 milligrams or better um, or greater and 25% or more. But when we look at the glomerular, glomerular filtration rate, um, when there is, when a patient starts off with less than 60 milliliters per minute per 1.73 uh, meters squared, then that puts them at risk. Oliguria is not usually noticed with contrast-induced nephropathy. Um, and it's pretty similar with AKI versus the C, versus CIN, it's usually about two to three days after the, um, after the event. Um, and we usually find it at around that time. It's a bit bright, the spotlight here. So why is this disease so important? Because it is the third most common cause of hospital-acquired um, renal failure, second to decrease renal blood perfusion, um, as well as nephrotoxic drugs. It's associated with extended length of stay, accelerated onset of end-stage renal disease, the need for dialysis, and increased costs and increased mortality. There are major risk factors um, associated with contrast-induced nephropathy. There are things that we can take care of, modify before they go in and have a contrast, um, before they have a, di a procedure, a cardiac catheterization. And there are things that we cannot um, control, such as pre-existing renal failure, um, age, diabetes, CHF or EF less than 40%, hemodynamic instability, nephrotic syndrome, or renal, uh, have a patient having renal transplant. Uh, major risk factors that are modifiable, things that we can take care of, you know, dehydration, um, contrast dye, type and dose, hypotension, concomitant use of nephrotoxic drugs, um, NSAIDs, and the like. Anemia, patient if, if the patient is in shock, sepsis, and the use of intraortic balloon pump. So we put intraortic balloon pump there because usually if it's an elective, you know, putting in an, an intraortic balloon pump signifies that the patient may have some hemodynamic instability um, during the PCI. Um, they may have some severe atherosclerotic disease and they need some hemodynamic um, assistance. Um, see here. Mentioning, Dr. Barman mentioned the, the risk score that Dr. Moran had. Um, so this is a way of knowing which patient is at risk for contrast-induced nephropathy. Um, as you can see there, if you have a high, every risk factor has an integer. And the higher the total is, that would show you the risk um, of contrast-induced nephropathy and the risk for dialysis. So as you can go, go down the list, if your um, estimated glomer glomerular filtration rate is reduced, um, you are given a higher integer. Um, so as you can see, the higher the risk, the higher the risk for contrast-induced nephropathy and the higher the risk for dialysis. 
And in summary there, the incidence of con contrast-induced nephropathy is higher among patients with chronic kidney disease and increases with the severity of renal dysfunction. These are GFR um, stages. Um, if you're renal, you can have chronic kidney disease um, with normal GFR, more than 90 uh, milliliters per minute per 1.73 meters squared. Um, stage two chronic kidney disease is if you're 60 to 89 GFR. Um, moderate uh, or stage three kidney disease is 30 to 59, and severe stage four is 15 to 29. As we know, stage five is end stage renal, and that's when we're talking about dialysis. Um, and this is what we're trying to prevent. Now, also mentioning diabetes, which my colleague Tia Coleman spoke about, um, she mentioned that patients with dia diabetes are at higher risk for microvascular complications, nephropathy, um, and this is why. So if you have somebody, a diabetic patient with a reduced GFR, um, going for a cardiac catheterization or a possible stent placement, or we know that they're going for a staged ICS, we know that we're gonna be giving contrast dye. Um, so we have to take that into account. We have to identify these patients before or they go into the procedure um, and know that they may need um, some treatment before they go and have that contrast I administered to them. And um, a randomized trial with 250 patients, they compared um, patients with diabetes with an increased creatinine, and they had a higher um, incidence of contrast-induced nephropathy compared to diabetic patients with normal creatinine. Now, also part of that study said that patients um, you know, patients with normal creatinine on diabetics and, you know, um, non-diabetics, they had no difference in contrast-induced nephropathy incidence. Um, so just for a quick pathogenesis of contrast-induced nephropathy, how does this happen? There's several um, theories. They haven't really quite figured, decided which way, but they all know that it affects the kidneys in a way that there is direct cellular toxicity. Um, they reduce oxygen um, supply to the kidneys, um, causing hypoxia, and that's how we have the nephrotoxicity. Um, as you can see here, see contrast, visc the, the contrast is, is viscous, it's thick, and it increases in the kidney, um, making it harder to excrete it. So if you have um, already a reduced renal function and then you add a nephrotoxic, a toxic agent, um, it furthers the impairment of the kidneys. And it takes about five days to flush this contrast unaided on your own. So how do we prevent contrast-induced nephropathy? So the current guidelines, the ACCH AHA, um, they not really recommend some things, but I wanna go into the one that 2012 uh, Kidney Disease Improving Global Outcomes uh, work group. And it said that the very first thing was we should assess the risk for chronic-induced um, AKI, acute kidney injury, or SIN, um, screen for patients who have pre-existing impairment of kidney function, use the lowest possible dose of contrast, and also use isoosmolar or low osmolar iodinated um, contrast media. Um, intravenous volume expansion with either isotonic uh, um, sodium chloride or sodium bicarb solution, um, that's a 1A recommendation. Um, the use of oral um, NAC or N-acetylcysteine together with IV isotonic crystalloids are considered, it's a 2D um, recommendation by um, this work group. Um, like I mentioned earlier, the ACC AHA um, did not uh, recommend the use of, con of uh, mucamist or an acetylcysteine, um, and there's been varying studies out there. So looking at the meta-analysis that I'm gonna present to you, this was released in 2016 from Annals of Internal Medicine, and they compared the effectiveness of prevention strategies for contrast-induced nephropathy. Um, so they looked at IV sodium bicarb versus IV saline, and it's pretty much you know, equal there. Um, but it had better results if they compared um, sodium bicarb and IV so, uh, saline with, can you see it? Okay. Um, 
the there's been other things that uh, people have been talking about statins and IV saline, ascorbic acid, um, hydration, just um, just is isotonic saline versus half NS. Um, and then we're going to go over a little bit with the mucomist as well, just comparing the subgroup analysis of mucomist. Overall, the key concept is hydration, prehydrating patients um, before they have the insult of the contrast dye. Oh, just to go back again, even though the statins here, you see here, statins plus um, n acetylcysteine um, plus IV saline versus an n acetylcysteine just an IV saline had a greater um, clinically significant. It has not been standard of practice to um, just prescribe statin by itself, you know, prevent it. Um, usually the, by this point, the patients are already on statins because they're going for a cat pause. Um, so in the subgroup analysis here, said that just to compare high dose um, mucomist versus low dose mucomist, and I said that, so some studies have been conflicting results. Some have said a, a higher dose um, plus uh, um, higher dose versus low dose mucomist. How often do you give it? Do you give it with normal saline? What kind of dye do you use? And what this meta-analysis is saying that if you um, higher dose of mucomis do better, um, but only if they are with a low osmolar contrast media. So it's not quite a clear answer. We have to look at other things as well, and that's including hydration with this study. And this is just to reiterate, um, you can see there's a 0.78% um, clinical significance of the using the mucomis um, with IV administration. So as nurses and technicians, uh, we are at the front line as well, speaking with our patients, knowing which patients are at risk for contrast-induced nephropathy. And the very, very important thing is identifying these patients, and identifying the risk factors um, before they have the contrast dye administered. So knowing their baseline um, kidney function, um, do they take medications that are nephrotoxic, um, are they dehydrated? What are, they, what are the things that we can modify? Um, Pre-medicating them as well. Um, and then when they go in the room, the choice of the contrast dye and the amount that we use. And that's a key point is hydration is key. Um, just to go back, the hydration is key. If somebody, um, if we know, we identify that a patient is at high risk for contrast-induced nephropathy by doing interview and speaking with the patient, knowing them, doing the integer score the, with uh, Dr. Moran's risk score. Um, we hydrate patients um, if they are outpatient. It's about three, when they come into us, three milliliters per kilogram per hour for about uh, one hour. And then we maintain the hydration for about one milliliter per kilogram per hour for about six hours, if possible, before the procedure. Um, here in Mount Sinai Cath Lab, our protocol has been uh, to, pre to give 1,200 milligrams of mucomist for outpatients before the procedure. If their heart function is normal, then we give a bolus of, about, of what I just said, the three milliliters per kilogram per um, uh, patient weight about 250, 300 cc's bolus, and then we maintain that by giving about 100 cc or so an hour until they go in the room. If they are inpatient, we usually hydrate them overnight, if possible, giving the mucomis as well. Um, and then after the procedure, we continue the hydration, and we also give another dose of mucomis uh, and acetylcysteine. I'm just mentioning renal guard. Um, this study, this has not been approved yet. It's still an investigational study here in America. Dr. Moran is, an, is a lead investigator in this study. Um, we're actually enrolling patients, I think we enrolled patients in renal guard. Um, so what this is, is uh, matching like forced diuresis with loop diuretics and then in matching that, whatever the output is, matching, the hyd matching that with hydration. So the theory behind it is that if you can induce diuresis, the contrast dye goes through the body quickly and then you hydrate the patient with whatever they put out, you match it. In Europe, with the Mythos trial, it showed um, decrease in the risk for contrast-induced nephropathy. Um, but like I said, it's still being uh, studied here, investigated, uh, investigational use here in America. So just a quick case study. Um, 
We have a 73-year-old African-American female with high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes. She has chronic kidney disease stage 2 and known coronary artery disease um, with a stent in the RCA in 2014. Um, she went to the clinic. She, she's saying that she has, um, she's presenting with recurrent exertional angina class 2, CCS class. Um, she's on um, Genuvia cetagliptin uh, metformin. Her baseline creatinine is 1.0. Her EEGFR is 65 milliliters per minute, which puts us at CKD stage 2. Um, she's scheduled for cath, pos, uh, possible PCI tomorrow afternoon. What would you do to prevent her from having contrast-induced nephropathy? So just going back to the integer score, um, let's see if I can go back quickly. We saw that she has, did I go too fast? So we saw that she has um, diabetes, so that's put her at risk of three. Her baseline creatinine is still kind of borderline. Um, so it'd be two, 40 to 60. So uh, three plus two is five. So she's about low risk for contrast-induced nephropathy. Um, so if she was going to come to Mount Sinai Cath Lab, our, and she was an outpatient, we would um, advise her to obviously have breakfast, and then just make sure that she does, stays hydrated you know, until the day of the procedure. She can drink some water until about um, 8 o'clock that morning, 6, 8 o'clock that morning, so she's not dehydrated. Um, and then on the, let me just pull up the, this one. So on, and then when she comes in, uh, we just advise her not to take her uh, metformin, her, anti, uh, her oral, oral antihypoglycemic that day. Um, when we get her in the cath lab, we will be um, checking her creatinine at that time. We will be starting her for hydration um, and probably give her some mucomist as indicated, you know, as what we mentioned before. Um, and then continue monitoring her, uh, her output and her hydration status during the case. Uh, and probably give her another dose of metformin before she goes home. Um, and that's about it. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, feel free.